How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric, and welcome to Out of the Groove. It's Show and Tell Tuesday edition. Stay tuned to the end of this episode. We'll be unpacking the mail y'all have sent in the last couple of weeks. But first and foremost, we've got some TV-related news to discuss. This episode is sponsored by Alka-Seltzer. Alka-Seltzer starts neutralizing acid in seconds for heartburn relief. It's also perfect to combat indigestion or an upset stomach. Alka-Seltzer has been a trusted brand for years. Your health is of the utmost importance, so if you're not feeling 100%, head on down down to your local Walmart and check out some Alka-Seltzer. Produced by Bayer, Alka-Seltzer available at Walmarts everywhere. Plop, plop, fizz, fizz, oh, what a relief it is. That's Alka-Seltzer for you. Thank you to Alka-Seltzer for supporting Out of the Groove. Now raise your hand if you watched the first ever SRX race live on CBS Saturday night. I did, I did. Not to brag or anything, but no, I tuned in, got to hear Alan Bestwick on the call for the first time in several years since I think the 2018 Indy 500. He hasn't called any motorsports since since then, he called a couple of iRacing events, but it was great to hear Alan Bestwick back with Danica Patrick adding her color commentary to the broadcast. CBS hosted the event, won by local short track hero Doug Kobe, winning over Tony Stewart, Greg Biffle, Haley Castro Nevis, Bobby Labonte were all in the top five. It was a pretty entertaining event, I think, all things considered a short track, getting some incredible national TV exposure. It was a sellout crowd of roughly 10,000 fans. New series, a lot of new drivers who haven't raced together ever or in many, many years. I think it went off pretty well. The highlight of the night for me was Greg Biffle winning the first heat in the number 69 car. It just, it doesn't get any weirder than that. But anyway, we're not really here to talk about the racing. I did a whole live stream a couple nights ago that many of you tuned into. I appreciate that. And if you haven't, my thoughts can be pretty well summarized there. But we're going to focus today instead on the TV ratings because the numbers are in and they are interesting and somewhat deceiving. Keep in mind the SRX is a brand new racing series and didn't get a whole lot of promotion leading up to this. Now I don't watch CBS, perhaps CBS aired a lot of promotion over its other broadcasts, but I didn't see any commercials anywhere else. I didn't see like YouTube ads. I really didn't see much anything for the SRX aside from what they were tweeting out on Twitter and putting on other social media themselves. But this was aired on network television, CBS and Saturday night prime time, sort of an interesting time of the week. A lot of competition out there. But here are what the numbers turned out to be. Reported by Adam Stern from Sports Business Journal. CBS earned 1.33 million viewers for last night's inaugural SRX racing event per TV ratings guide. Now those are just preliminary numbers, but I think it's safe to say they are very close to, if not directly on the actual mark. On the surface, 1.3 million viewers for a brand new racing series is pretty dang good. Keep in mind, that's probably a little more than the average NASCAR Xfinity Series race takes in. Granted, most Xfinity Series races are on cable, not network television, but still, I mean, this year's Daytona opener on Fox got, I think, roughly 1.6 million. This wasn't too far off of that. Now, I did see some people on Twitter and other social media talking about how people at the SRX were expecting two or three million viewers. I, I have found no way to confirm if that's true or not. If you know in the comments and can link to maybe an article where Ray Everham made such a prediction, let me know but I think two or three million viewers was going to be unrealistic for this, especially given that it didn't get much marketing outside of, again, their existing social media channels. So no, this thing was never going to get three million viewers. Heck, many NASCAR Cup Series races don't get three million viewers these days. I don't think the SRX was ever going to break that number, but I also don't think realistically they were expecting to. Now, that 1.33 million viewer number, while that seems pretty decent on the surface, if we add some context around it, that number is a little deceiving. So the SRX went up directly against an NBA playoff game. Also, Fox was airing a Major League Baseball game, a regular season game between the Twins and the Astros. And there was also Olympic diving trials on NBC. And all three of those events beat the SRX in viewership in roughly the same time slot. And things get a little worse for the SRX when we look at the actual rating. So according to those preliminary numbers, the SRX premiere got a rating of 0 0.2, 0 0.2, that's right. When it comes to the age 18 to 49 demographic, the most valuable age demographic according to TV marketing. That's not very good at all. So that says a couple of things. What that tells me is that the SRX is resonating at least somewhat with older fans. People above the age of 50 who probably grew up watching Tony Stewart, Bobby Labonte, Michael Waltrip race, in some cases who long for the glory days of NASCAR to perhaps return, those are the fans, that's the demographic that does seem to be tuned in and interested in the superstar racing experience. 
experience. And there is value in that. That means, wow, they're successful at at least reaching a target audience. But unfortunately for the SRX, that you know, 50, 60 and older demographic is not nearly as valuable to advertisers as again, that 18 to 49 prime demographic. And that's what a lot of these TV ratings are based on. So that 0.2 TV rating in the 18 to 49 demographic shows that the SRX made little progress reaching the younger fan base. Young fans just don't seem that interested in the superstar racing experience. 20 year olds apparently don't really care to see Tony Stewart and Tony Kanaan and Helio Castroneves race at short tracks. So there's two ways to look at this. From a traditional television sense, no, the SRX did not get good ratings Saturday night. But early on, Tony Stewart and Ray Everham made it clear that they weren't focusing on those fans. They were focusing on the older fans, the disenchanted fans, fans who've grown out of touch with NASCAR, who don't feel like NASCAR and maybe even IndyCar or other racing series for that matter really represent them anymore. That too, Tony Stewart, Ray Everham, and the entire SRX really seemed to be trying to reach. And the fact that they got 1.3 million viewers, again, not a bad number at all, but many of them fell outside of that 18 to 49 age demographic. One could look at that as though their mission was successful. They reached the fans they were attempting to reach. They didn't break into many other markets, but they at least reached the fans they set out to reach first and foremost. So I don't know how you look at that. I think from CBS's perspective, they'd like to reach the 18 to 49 demographic, the ones that most advertisers are trying to reach. So I'm not sure that CBS is gonna be thrilled with that rating. CBS has signed a multi-year contract with the SRX, so we can expect to see them broadcasting these races for at least a, a couple of years. But from the SRX's standpoint, perhaps mission accomplished if you're Tony Stewart. I don't know. We'll see how next week's ratings compare. and We'll see how the rest of this six week stretch compares to the opening event at Stafford. But I thought that number was very interesting. Solid viewership, but not a good traditional television rating. I don't know what that says about the SRX, but continuing this conversation, talking more about CBS, because CBS, the network, has been in the headlines the last few days. You know, for a few weeks there, they seem to be maybe the sneaky front runners to nab next season's IndyCar rights. You know, NBC's contract is up after this year, and many people seem to think CBS was going to step up as a real player. It might make a serious bid for the IndyCar television rights. According to Sean McManus, the chairman of CBS Sports, they will not be bidding on IndyCar this coming off season. And in fact, they won't be bidding on any more motorsports series rights, period, for at least the foreseeable future. Again, here's some of what Sean McManus said. He told the Associated Press, our commitment right now is to the SRX and our programming schedule really precludes us from picking up a series like the IndyCar series. Even on Indianapolis 500 week, on race day, we've got commitments to golf. And he goes on to talk about all the other sports scheduling conflicts they have. You know, CBS has a huge NFL contract during the fall. They have college basketball as a big thing in the spring. So, you know, aside from these few weekends in the summer, which lines up nicely for the SRX, CBS doesn't seem to have much room in their scheduling for not just any other motorsports, but really many other sports in general, especially weekend sports. So in the last couple days, more news has come out. It looks like NBC is going to extend their agreement with IndyCar. They're gonna be the TV partner for that series for the foreseeable future. Now the question turns to NASCAR. NBC and Fox's existing NASCAR contracts do not expire until after the 2024 season. So we still have a few years to go. Perhaps things can change. But CBS also has long-term contracts with many of those other sports leagues I just mentioned, like the NFL, like the PGA. So. Looking ahead to 2025, CBS may not be a major player for NASCAR's new TV rights. It sounds like Fox and NBC are going to continue to bid for them. Maybe some other networks or other companies take a look in there and bid on it, but it looks like CBS is sort of taking a back seat. That's kind of a race car term there. When it comes to going after other motorsports broadcast rights. So uh, it's fun to see Alan Bestwick, Lindsey Zarniak, Brad Doherty, and that whole team back in action on CBS this summer for the SRX, but... We may not get many more motorsports on CBS in the foreseeable future. Just wanted to share that with you guys. I don't really know what to make of it because we still are three plus years away from a new agreement needing to be struck. I think just as before, we gotta wait and see what happens to IndyCar. Does NBC once again get their broadcast rights for another year or several years? That of course could have some effect on what networks bid on NASCAR in a few years. But one general idea I've seen many kind of agree on recently is that NASCAR's next TV contract may still be pretty dang massive. They may not get quite the same, you know, I mean, Fox and NBC right now are paying like three quarters of a billion dollars combined per year to broadcast all the NASCAR races. It may not be quite that high, but I wouldn't be surprised if NASCAR's next TV contract is still gargantuan. 
Live sports are crucial to cable television and television in general these days. Traditional television I'm talking about, not like Netflix or HBO, but like traditional network television. Live sports are the cash cow right now. They are what's keeping many of these networks afloat more often than not. So I think many of these networks, whether that's Fox, NBC, maybe CBS, something changes, or maybe there's another network, Turner Sports comes back, ESPN, who knows? Whoever it is, I think NASCAR is still gonna get a pretty hefty deal in 2025. But it's a few years away, we have plenty of time to speculate between now and then, but I just wanted to share with you guys that news that CBS is not interested in picking up any new motorsports anytime soon. But let me know what you think about that. Let me know your thoughts on the SRX TV rating for their first ever race. Do you think it'll go up? Do you think it'll go down? Do you think they'll break into that younger demographic going forward, especially as drivers like, you know, Haley Deegan set to make a couple starts? What do you think happens over there? Let me know down in the comments. Now, it's that glorious time of the week. It's time for Show and Tell Tuesday. As always, thank you all so, so much for sending me things to my P.O. box, letters, packages. I greatly, greatly appreciate it. Now, as you probably know, I'm going to be on the road over the next couple of weeks, so we may not have a show until Tuesday for a while, but I have a feeling once I get back in town, we're going to have a pretty major one to go through. But I really do appreciate those of you who choose to send things to that P.O. box. That address is down in the description if you'd like to join in on the action. Let's see what we got here to start. This first box comes from Jacob in Indiana. Uh, Jacob sent a really nice letter, and he also sent a Matt DiBenedetto all-star race from 2020. 164 scale scheme. Look at that. You got the number slid back and everything. Oh, boy. This is pretty freaking cool, Jacob. He also sent these stickers. Where did you get these? I heart die cast. I like that. I'm putting one on. No idea what this is from, but hey, that's me, if that, if anyone. Thank you, Jacob. Next up, we have a package from Eric from Michigan. He sent a nice postcard. He says he found this at a yard sale. Oh, my gosh. Oh, would you look at this? It's Kevin Harvick. It's a Kevin Harvick figurine. Oh, from the old Bush Series Reese's days. Look at this. Hey, I think they got Kevin Harvick's features almost exactly right. This thing is incredible. Like, honestly, that looks a lot like Kevin Harvick. That's kind of scary how good it is. But this is amazing. I wish they still made driver figurines like this, especially if they can get the faces that accurate. This looks incredible. Thanks for sharing, Eric. Got a big box here from Kyle in Oklahoma. When I hear stuff moving around in here, all right. I appreciate the groovy letter, Kyle. Always good to see you on live streams as well. Oh my gosh, he sent he sent a crazy box. First thing I see when I open this up, Matt Kenseth. Oh, the Lycos car. This thing is old school. From his Bush Series days, look, he got Chevrolet on the nose as well. You know, Matt Kenseth's first ever NASCAR win in anything was 1998. It was a Bush Series race. Wasn't this paint scheme, but at the time they were running a different Lycos paint scheme that Lycos wasn't even paying for. They were just putting their logo on the car as a thank you, trying to get more races out of them, more sponsorship out of them. And he went out and beat Tony Stewart at Rockingham. Pretty great race. So this is a pretty cool, uh, stealthy black paint scheme as well. Oh my gosh, and there's a larger die cast. Matt Kenseth, whoa! Early, early paint scheme. I love it. This looks super duper clean. A lot of retro Matt Kenseth stuff here, Kyle. This is crazy. This is kind of interesting. Look at the interiors all white. Don't really see that. I feel like you don't see that very often on 124 scale cars. I feel like it's usually black, or maybe I'm just... Uh, do I have another car here to compare? I mean, yeah, all those. Well, the Dale Earnhardt one is red, I guess, because, you know, Dale Earnhardt. But all these other ones are black. I mean, some of those are newer, but... Yeah, I guess that Casey Kane, that white and red one up on the shelf, that one has a white interior. So I guess it's some here, some there. But this looks really cool. There are a ton of random goodies in here, including some trading cards, of course. Greg Biffle, this was 2012, I believe. I like that. What the heck? Why is he, like, so faded blue? That's Matt Kenseth, 2012 as well. But why is it, like... Why is it this color? What, what, are my eyes messed up? What's happening here? Also, here's a Mark Martin. Well, a lot of good Roush trading cards in here. Thank you for sharing, Kyle. Speaking of Roush, a few 164 scale cards, including Ricky Stenhouse, the Zest Machine. I always liked the Zest card. Stenhouse, Kenseth, it's just a pretty color. I like it. Goodness, there are a lot of random things in here, but perhaps nothing more random than this. Stock rods? What the heck? They made anything into a die cast back in the day. So this is a Matt Kenseth, uh, what? 1956 Ford Victoria, I believe. I'm not the biggest car guy in the world, so I don't know everything about what this is supposed to be, but look at that. The hood comes up and everything. Wow. This thing is awesome. It's from the year 2000, so I guess this is based off Matt Kenseth's rookie year paint scheme. That's pretty gnarly. <laughs> Just turning to James Davison for a second there, but thank you for sharing all of this awesome stuff, Kyle. Really do appreciate it. All right, we have one more big box here from Justin in Nebraska, I believe, right? Isn't that what N-E is? Nebraska? I was going to say New England. I'm like, New England's not a state. So Nebraska, I believe. Let's see what's inside. Bubble wrap. Oh! The first thing I see when I open this is Adam Petty 
Whoa. Oh, sorry, I gotta show it to you guys. Sorry, I was starstruck for a second. Adam Petty, Chevy, Monte Carlo, 164 scale edition. Oh my goodness, this is a an iconic paint scheme. The colors are incredible. Bubba Wallace th uh, threw back to this paint scheme a, a couple of years ago and it was gorgeous then and it was gorgeous originally. Wow, that is a really cool throwback 164 scale die cast right there. That's, that's incredible. As Kyle Petty would say. Some other throwbacks in here. Look at this, that's Jason Leffler, wow. Hitting on a lot of old racing legends right here. Jason Leffler, the singular, the singular, how do you say it? The singular colors and logos? Didn't they turn to what, like at and or something? I don't know what they are now, but yeah, miss these old orange cars on track. Oh, as well as Kenny Irwin, check this out. Man, where did you find all these? These are incredible, this is awesome. That's super cool and there's more in here. Oh, what the heck, this thing is loose in the box. Oh, it's Ron Hornet. What, what it's loose. What's going on here? Uh, I'm gonna take it out of the box to get a view of it, but here we go. DEI Ron Hornaday Bush Series car. Oh, it's missing the rear window. I don't know, did it fall out? Is it in here still? Oh yeah, it's still in the box. It just popped out, but whoa! The three, the blue and the yellow Napa colors, the classic. Well, not really necessarily the classic DEI look to it, but you know, there's something about it that just still screams DEI. Just the three alone and the Chevy Monte Carlo style body. This is incredible. Ron Hornaday, truck series legend, but here you go, Bush series car. That's cool. It was loose in this box, so I'm gonna have to try and put that rear window back in it, but thank you so much for sharing, Justin. Oh, and there's one other thing in here. This is nuts. Keeping with the Earnhardt theme, is this Dale Earnhardt Jr.? Yes, it says Dale Earnhardt Jr., his Bush Series Championship. We got another figurine. It also, this one comes with a die cast, but check it out, Dale Jr. Uh, compared to the Harvick, I don't think they got the face quite as correct on this Dale Earnhardt Jr. one, but still, he's got the trophy. This looks really, really awesome. Man, I wish we had more modern day NASCAR collectibles like this. I want figurines of William, I wanna see a Matt Benedetto figurine. Buff and everything, show it to me. I wanna see it. This is also, oh, and I missed it at the bottom here. Matt Ken's at the Pez dispenser. Has it got candy in it? Not yet. No, no, no candy. It's probably safest. I, I don't think I'd eat candy out of a box like this, but yeah, I had one of these as a kid. I lost it, probably broke it, threw it away, probably like an idiot. I don't know, but this is pretty cool. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Pretty awesome show and tell Tuesday. Right before I hit the road, I really do appreciate all of you who send things into the PO box and share them with us here on show and tell Tuesday. Really, really means a lot to me. Thank you guys so much. As always, a huge, huge thank you to my amazing Patreon supporters. I couldn't do this show without your incredible support. It's thanks to you guys that I'm able to go out on the road for a couple weeks, film some great stuff at the racetrack, and hopefully gonna visit some Charlotte NASCAR landmarks very soon. That's thanks to your incredible support. Thank you all so, so much. I feel like I'm just thanking everyone here. Oh yeah, I forgot I even have the I Heart Diecast stickers on. I'm keeping that on. That's This is a permanent part of this shirt now. I love it. We all heart diecast here, but thank you guys so, so much for watching. I will see you in the next video. Have a fantastic rest of your Tuesday.